Speaking of reframing uh, our perspective, that's 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 uh, that's our that's our that's our merge into the next series across our campuses, all three campuses today. It's a very exciting day. Not only starting a new month, we're starting a new a new series, uh, learning from God's word. Uh, we're calling the series "Reframe" because. In our lives, it's so easy for us to be viewing things one way, and it looks a certain way. We just kind of move, we react because of the way we see it looking one way, and then we get new information. Uh, We get a different perspective. We get a fuller picture, and then suddenly we realize, oh, (laughs) things look very different. When you, when you look at it that way. Let me give you some examples. Uh, I'll give you a picture right now. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the famous the pyramids of Egypt. Maybe you've seen pictures like this before. It's beautiful. You might say, yes, I also had a history book when I was a, you know, in school. I, no big deal. Um, maybe nothing wow here. But when you reframe the pyramids against the surrounding terrain, uh, maybe like this, There's a little more wow there, isn't there? You look at the entire city skyline behind and you realize, man, those things are huge. Like if we had a couple of those in Round Lake Beach, I don't know where we'd put them. It's huge. (laughs) Let's play again. Here, I'll show you this picture. This is a picture of, uh, uh, you know, of a monument just outside uh, the Pantheon in Greece. You look at a postcard like that and you think, wow. One day, what would it be like to stand under that and look all the way up and, and feel the history and just the magnitude of that, of that monument? But let's reframe our perspective. Uh, this is the same monument looking through the, the door of McDonald's across the street. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, uh, they say that the ancient monument uh, will will uh, will naturally decay more quickly than the French fries. So it's you know it's just something. <laughs> I mean, no judgment if that's where you're headed after church. Go ahead, it's, it's fine. Leave some in the back seat for the kids. But the, here's the point: uh, I'm gonna put all four of those shots up. And and when when you when you experience the power of what happens when you reframe what you're look like, what what you're looking at. I mean, when we correct our perspective according to what's real, isn't it amazing the kind of shift that can occur? This is, this is us, the beginning of a journey together, understanding what reframing can do for our perspective. And as we do that, let me ask you something. What do you think is going to happen in life when you or I don't realize when we are in dire need of reframing our perspective. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to you? Here's what's going to happen. You're going to, let's example. You're going you're gonna to look, you're going to be looking at a missed call at your kid's flag football game. You know, referee misses it, and you're going to get hot, and you're going to rip the referee a new one from the bleachers when actually... What you're also doing is, is you're, 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 you're trading that you're losing a lot of respect of the good people around you, maybe even including your kid. Or we'll be looking at a, a difficult season in our marriage, and we will just convince ourselves it's time to quit. When actually, maybe it's actually time to double down and, and watch God really get to work, saving something incredible. We'll look at something that we have that the culture calls essential, and we will think to ourselves, okay, I've really got it going on here. When actually that thing is more of a distraction to your soul than you realize. Or we'll look at a person in society who's pretty rough around the edges, and we'll think to ourselves, that is someone to avoid, when actually it's someone to pursue. Someone to include. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But 
what would be good for all of us, I think, me included, at the beginning of a journey like this is to admit that we are a people of narrow perspectives, are we not? We don't know what we don't know. People of narrow perspectives, and we got to admit that sometimes we treasure the insignificant while we miss the important. We go hard after things that we would be better off ignoring, mostly, if not completely. And we have this way of looking back at our lives later on and seeing how we allowed true value to just slip right through our fingers. You know what we need? We need another perspective. We, we need someone. We need someone with a, a better perspective, a, a heavenly perspective that would reframe our earthly assumptions. And I have never been able to find a better way to do that than through God's word. God's word has been around for centuries. It has never been proven inaccurate. It has never ceased to be anything less than cutting edge relevant for our lives. And at the end, it has never failed to tell us the fuller truth about the lives that we live. And so not only do we get to go through a journey reframing our perspective, but we get to go through a journey of a specific section of the Bible. Let me show you where to find it. Uh, if you'll pull out a Bible that maybe you brought, maybe you're borrowing from us. Uh, this is different. If you're opening a Bible app right now, then just look P-H-I-L. We're going to go through uh, what we call the book of Philippians. And this book is a collection of 66 books. If, you, if I was not using my table of contents, which you're, contents, which you're allowed to, uh, to do, I'm going to go from the back. I'm gonna, just going to start flipping, and I see the book of Revelation now, which is a chunky book at the end, and then a little, some little books, and there's Hebrews. And then you get into this little section uh, of books that are as short as letters, and there's a reason for that. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, spelled with a P-H. You're, you're looking, you're finding, you're finding, you're looking. I love it, P-H-I-L. And you could miss it because it's only four chapters long. It's a whole, that's a whole book. It's a whole book. You can read the, you can read the whole book. Um, and I would encourage you to do that because over the next several weeks, uh, we're going we're gonna to study uh, the book of Philippians, and it's going to help us learn to uh, reframe. And from the very first verse of this book, it tells us what it's going to be about, who it's from, what it is. So let's look at that together, can we? Chapter 1, verse 1, uh, the first, maybe we'd call that the first few paragraphs there. That's our yard today. That's where we're going to play. And verse 1, chapter 1, uh, it shows us that the primary letter, uh, excuse me, the primary writer is Paul. Or you may have heard of him as the Apostle Paul. He's composing this letter to a church that he planted. He helped plant it in the city of Philippi. That's why it's called the letter to the Philippians or why we just call it Philippians. Uh, Philippi uh, was a colony of Rome at the time, and Paul had spent some significant time there. He's going to write the people and the leaders of this little church, this growing church of Christians, a letter. And when you read the whole book, you get a pretty clear idea some of the hard things that this church was going through. There was a little bit of turmoil inside, and the, the church could have been, you know, even half or a sixth of this room. It's just believers who are living their lives for Jesus. They've surrendered their lives to Jesus. They're working on obeying. They're working on that affecting their relationships. But towards the end of the letter, you see that not, was, not all things were great in the church. Maybe you've been to a church, this church or another church, where there were some relational problems. And you wish that didn't matter so much, but here's the thing. A church is nothing if it's not its relationships. It's not about the bricks. It's about the people. And when the relationships aren't right, then the church just kind of feels sick, right? And you've been to, we, we, we've been through seasons like that where you just kind of, oh, people are avoiding each other. Oh, people aren't talking. Oh, things are, people are saying things. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great Petri dish for like sin to grow. So what do we do? Well, you go find another church. No, you don't go find another church. You stand up for the relationships that Jesus is buying, the people that Jesus bought, and, and, and you work with it. You sit down with people. You, you, you work it out. Well, they were in the middle of working it out. They, they needed some pastoral help. So I know things are, don't feel good in your church right now. 
let me help. Let me help. I, I know the players. Let me, let me talk some sense in you guys, things like that. Also, outside the church, stuff was, stuff was hard. Stuff was hard. The society was very unfriendly to Christianity. They needed encouragement to keep going and, and exactly what to focus on, how to do it. And so this is a letter that provides a ton of like muscle-bound encouragement for believers, but if you were to zoom away from the letter and its writer, if you were to zoom out, you would, you would see something amazing that completely reframes this letter. Is that Paul, who writes the letter? He's, he's typing this email. <laughs> and he's doing it from prison. He's doing it from a prison cell. So Paul, at this point in time, he has no idea when he'll get his freedom back. He has no idea when his sentence will end. I don't know if I want to listen to a con man. No, this, this, is, this is a guy who's been in prison for serving Jesus Christ. That's it. But he has no idea how long he'll be there. That's not how the system works in his day. He's, he is completely dependent on any local friends he might have to feed him and care for him, or he could very well just starve to death in that cell. He could get sick and die in that cell. That's his life. Oh, and one more thing. Every single hour of the day, he is chained to a Roman guard. No ping pong at this jail. Yet, now that that's in your picture... Let's just see how he starts the letter. It's a letter from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all God's holy people. Timothy's probably in town. He's not in the jail cell. But he's writing it from Paul and Timothy. Slaves of Christ Jesus, I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace, promises. I probably am not writing that, starting the letter that way. Get me out of here. Hello, mother. Hello, father. Like, I, I want out. But since God has reframed his view on life, even though Paul's situation, it appears grim, doesn't it? It appears wearying. It appears doomed. This is something we're going to see today, is that the man is oozing with confidence. He's oozing with confidence. Confidence. We've talked a lot about where the series is, is, is going to go. Let me identify for you now where we start the series, right here. It's on this idea of confidence. Today we want to reframe our confidence. As I picture Paul writing this letter, saying the things he's going to say, saying them from his heart. It reminds me of, uh, I, I would say, the more you think about it, like many, many a movie moment where like the hero character, the protagonist in the story, uh, a lot of times at the climax of the movie, not always, but it reminds me of these moments where the hero characters dar in, in their darkest hour, there's actually like this glint in his eye or her eye. You know what I'm talking about? It's, the, it's, the, it's almost like it's like, I know something you don't know kind of glint in their eye. You know what I'm talking about? Like, um, it's like when Marty McFly... In Back to the Future, he's, there's that moment where he's being held at gunpoint and he has been backed to the edge of a very tall building. And, and, and with that glint in his eye, he just takes one more step back and falls completely off the building. Because he knows that the DeLorean is hovering just below to catch him, right? Or, or, or think about... Uh, uh, think about in The Princess Bride when the man in black, when the man in black uh, challenges a genius to a battle of wits to discern uh, where the poison is in the goblets that they're about to drink because he knows that he put poison in both of them and he's spent several years building up an immunity to iocane powder. Or, 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 or think about even just like the movie Aladdin where at the end of the movie, Aladdin says uh, to the evil Jafar, you know what you should do? You should use your third wish from the lamp to make yourself an all-cosmic, uh, all-cosmic powerful genie because he knows what's that going to do. 
it's going to trap him as a genie inside a lamp. Now, we could go on. If I didn't touch your movie genre, I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> you want Hallmark movies, wait for Kelsey to preach. But my point, my point <laughs> is that <laughs> and this, is, this, is how, this is how I want to start the series with you. It's with that, it's with that winner's glint in, in Paul's eye. When it looks like Paul is washed up, he's forgotten, he's without hope, he is speaking from the heart as if he's got the world by the tail. And he's saying... Hey, I'm good. God, I mean, God has perfectly placed me where I am right now. I, I can see how he's working in me. I can see how he's working through me. This is productive. God has greater purposes. I think I know some of them. The other ones probably are just as great. I just can't see them yet. You and I got to look at that and just ask ourselves this question. How can I have that kind of confidence in my life? How how can that be me? And as we read the first few paragraphs, this is what I want to show you. I want to show you four reminders that Paul is going to give us that are going to reframe our confidence for the life that you're about to go back into. I mean, this is your life. I'm not disregarding that. But I also know this. These moments when we're together with God's word and we're praying and we're worshiping and we're, and we're getting closer to God, getting closer to each other, this is like a locker room compared to the big game. This is going to reframe our confidence. I want to give you four reminders of that so that we can press forward through shaky, shaky times. So let's continue in the letter. By, by verse 3, Paul is writing this. Check it out. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. That's, I just tell you, contextually, it's a pretty surprising statement considering what Paul experienced when he was with them in Philippi. If you wanted to see some of the stories, you could turn in your Bible to a more historically natured, like a historic record, uh, Acts, the book of Acts. Some amazing stories in the book of Acts. Acts 16 it kind of details his journey to Philippi and how this church came together. And that was a pretty miserable trip. Like, have you ever had a miserable trip and you think back out in there, you're like, ugh, I'm never camping again. You know, it's like there are, there, there are trips that we have that are just horrendous. When Paul was in Philippi, he was stalked, he was yelled at, he was roughed up, he was thrown into jail, he was chased out of town. But what he says is, look, I give thanks to God every time I think, for you, every time I think of you, every time I think of the city that you are reaching for Christ. I just get full of gratitude. Wow. This is reminder number one. And this is for, this is for you and me. Reminder number one, there, there is always good to focus on. Write that down. Don't forget this. You want confidence in shaky times? There's always good to focus on. It's a choice to be grateful. I know sometimes we feel grateful, right? Better off thinking of gratitude as a choice. It is a choice to be grateful no matter what. Did you know this? That, that several studies, a number of studies have shown that people who build a habit in their lives of practicing gratitude routinely have better grades, better habits, better sleep, less sickness, and more fulfilling relationships. It's like gratitude is the secret sauce to life. Or what the cool kids say, gratitude is like the cheat code to the game of life. It's gratitude. And here's what's really fascinating. The leading researcher on gratitude, his name is Dr. Robert, Robert Emmons, he concluded that it's never the circumstances that lead to the gratitude. After all of his research, after all his learnings, it was always gratitude in any circumstances that led to the, all of these better outcomes. It's kind of like what a, a Benedictine monk, uh, David uh, Steindl, uh, Steindl Rast, he, he said it this way. It's, it's pretty well said. He said, it's, it's not joy that makes us grateful. It is the gratitude that makes us joyful. I mean, the only other, the missing piece there is, 
you know, what do you choose to do? The question is not, are you feeling grateful today, my friend? The real question is, will you practice gratitude? It was long before Dr. Emmons. Here's what Paul was teaching the followers of Jesus. He, he said, he wrote, be thankful in all circumstances. Have you heard that one before? Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Christ Jesus. Like you knew God wanted you to experience his joy. Maybe you just didn't realize he was expecting you to get it through gratitude. So be thankful in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. One of the very best ways we can reframe our perspective is when we choose gratitude. That is when the annoyances, the irritations of life might throw us off course and yet we can find the good and we can be grateful for the good. No one is asking you to fake gratitude. You find the good and you choose to be grateful for that. Let that be center mass of your view and that will keep us moving forward, steady on, doing what's necessary, doing what's right, no matter what. So reminder number one, there's always good to focus on. Here's a second reminder to give you confidence in shaky times. Ready? Reminder number two, God is still making me stronger. And we know this. God is still making me stronger because of what Paul writes just a few lines later. You want to see it? It's it's verse six. He says, I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I really want you to see this. The words Paul uses here are began and complete. And in the middle, there's always a process, right? Uh, Anybody who follows the NBA... Uh, probably knows the name Joel Embiid. He was, the, he was the number one draft pick, went to the Philadelphia 2nd 76ers, and pretty much any sports league really hangs all their hopes on that number one draft pick, not just the first rounder, but the number one. Uh, we got to choose first. They picked Joel Embiid. He's like seven foot three. He was amazing in college. This guy is gonna, he's gonna create a dynasty. He's gonna turn this team around. It's gonna be great for the city. Finally, we're gonna have a winning team. And then he breaks this little bone in his foot. And it takes so long to work through that. It, it, it created complications. He didn't play a single game that first year. They're like, oh, they've been holding their breath for this. And then the really bad news came out. Is that, is that the, the, the healing was, was nowhere near where it should have been by that point. And he didn't play another. He didn't play a single game. The second year, he's a pro. He's making millions of dollars to just, like, do therapy is so deflating, so frustrating. And the chant from Philadelphia became this, trust the process. People had signs, trust the process. And it paid off just last year. Joel Embiid was the NBA MVP of the league. He finally got strong. He finally came back. And he's a force, and he, and, 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 and he leads the team. Trust the process. You and I... Paul says, our mid-process. And that can be encouraging, but it can be encouraging to hear what God has began in us, but also frustrating. Because what, this is what we would like. You ever catch yourself wishing that once you surrender your life to Jesus, you know, God would just like sprinkle a little angel dust on you and then, you know, no more irritations, no more frustrations, no more temptations, no more mistakes. And there are people who believe that that's the way it's supposed to work. And there's only one problem with that theory. It's the Bible. Because <laughs> the Bible says, well, dude, he, he just got started. He, he, he began. The good news is that it also says he will certainly continue. He will certainly continue until the day comes when you are facing Jesus in glory, and you can just drop all of your weight into his arms until that moment comes. He is certain to continue a perfecting work in you that that starts in your heart and works its way out to your skin and through your skin 
through your attitudes, through your actions. God is still making you stronger. This is great to know. This is why when you've told God a hundred times before that you are done giving into that habit, you are done obsessing over that hurt, you are done recommitting that hang up, and then you do it again. This is why you don't quit. This is why you don't throw in the towel. This is why. This is why. This is why when you feel empty and you would rather complete yourself through some kind of shortcut that would numb the pain that you're experiencing in life, instead, you surrender yourself again and you trust the process that God is working in your life. It's because we have a mighty good promise, and it's this God is changing you. He's doing something. Do you belong to Jesus Christ? If you do, then you got to know this. This was never about you changing yourself. That's his job. That's what he will do. This was never about you changing yourself. This is not about behavior modification. This is about what God is doing as a new thing in your life, and he's certain to do it. You want to talk certain? It reminds me of this verse in Romans 8. It says, For God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of your son. The part we immediately like is God is making me, he's working me to look just like Jesus eventually. The part that won't fit in my brain is what is this like predestined and for new stuff? In moments like this come where we read something that's real, God kind of pulls the curtain back to eternity and reveals all the things that we can't even understand what it would be like to know. And when God does that, I just want you to know this. He's not trying to frustrate you, make you mad, confuse you. He's trying to encourage you that you are in a better position than you realize. What God is doing in your life, if you belong to him, is irrevocable. And it's going to be okay. He's going to force all of this to lead you to become more like Jesus. And so on the days when it appears that you're half-baked, there's a good reason for that. because you're mid-process. And what he's going to do is continue doing whatever he's doing. All that he's doing, he who began a good work in you, he won't stop until you are a 10 in his book. And he's got a good book. And that's why we keep giving our best, even when our best doesn't seem like it's enough, and trust that God is going to do whatever's best from that point forward. He's not going to let up maturing you. He's not going to let up spiritually upgrading you until you're perfect or you're home. God's not done. God's not done. Two reminders down, two to go. Check this out. Reminder number three. Comes, comes from the text. Reminder number three. This, is, this will give you confidence in shaky times. God's truth always proves true. Would you write that down? God's truth always proves true. Let's continue at verse nine. This is where he's, he's talking about how he prays for them. It's, it, it, it's always fun. It's always fun to hear pastors talk about how they pray for their people. And as he prays for them, you see another surefire way to reframe your confidence in shaky times. He says, I pray that you'll keep on growing in, keyword here, knowledge. I pray that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. He prays they will grow in what they know. Now, if you've been around Heritage, you know that we just spent a whole series validating and leveraging the value of our emotions. How many people enjoyed that series? That was a game changer for many of us. And you'll remember, I'm not throwing... Emotions under the bus. You'll remember that the entire time we were upfront about this, that there is a huge difference between feelings and facts. Remember that? That emotions may have led you to reach out for Jesus, which is awesome, but knowledge is what gives us the confidence to keep choosing Jesus. 
Emotions, emotions are wild. They, they go up, they go down, they go sideways. They, they, they can change based on if you need to eat a banana or some fiber <laughs> or you just drank a Red Bull. Like emotions can be all over the place. Knowledge of the truth, that's what gives us an unshifting foundation for living our whole lives. Emotions, they're crazy like this. Emotions can cause us to feel motivated in our faith, and they can also cause us to feel unmotivated in our faith. They can cause us to engage more in worship and prayer and community, and emotions can cause us to engage less in those things as well. They can, emotions can be powerful, but they, are, they were never designed to be enough Greater knowledge always reframes my view when I've been living with an emotional lens. Are times tough for you right now? I promise you, you've been living with an emotional lens. Riding a high, riding a low, that's just, that's just this is how it is for us. But knowledge, it keeps me factoring in the important things like God's promises, God's purposes, God's design, God's rhythms, God's ways, even when I feel like doing something different. He says, Paul says, you can do better than just feeling good. I want you to, let me show you verse 10 again. He says, I want you to keep growing in knowledge and understanding for I want you, I want you to understand what really matters. Can anybody here testify, I've lived whole seasons of my life not understanding what really matters. Promise you, it's the same list of people who would say, I'd love to go back and do that over again if I could. Take another swipe at that, please. Paul says, I want you to understand what really matters. That is a, that knowledge makes it a better guarantee on where your behaviors are always going to, to, to lead you in every season of my life. I have in some way witnessed how my heart can be an untrustworthy dictator of my decisions. But when you keep trusting what is true, listen, that is how you know you will stick the landing. When you keep trusting what is actually true, this is how you make every chapter in your life promise to make a positive investment in the next chapter. Every single time. This is, how, this is how you end well at a job, even if they didn't treat you well. This is, this is how you face the feelings that would keep you in an addiction, but then also push right through those feelings. This is how to be sure that no matter who your life touches, you will in some way, shape, or form be a blessing to those people. That is what Paul meant in the very next verse when he says this. Check it out. He says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Fill your life full. Think of a, think of a tree. It's like, man, it's harvest time. Can we please get some fruit off of this tree? May your life be filled with the fruit of your salvation, aka the proof is in the pudding. It's there. It's It's real. What is that fruit? Well, greater knowledge for them, understanding for them, leads to the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. That will bring much glory and praise to, to God. The truth always leads you to the proof. And that you can see, taste, touch, smell, experience. It's what you can know. Confidence in life always comes down to what you know. Do you want to know more so your confidence can go up? Let an eternal God teach you about the things that will never change. And just like Paul prayed for the Philippians, I pray that you will grow and flourish in that. that. I mean, there, there are, there's so much reframing that we have to look forward to in this series, folks. I can't wait. I, 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 hope, you, I hope you don't miss a Sunday. We can be together every week. We'll just keep coming back. And I think God's going to blow our minds. But let, let me just do this. Let me, let me give you just one more reminder from this passage. It's four in total. Here's the fourth one. Because we can't ignore it. Reminder number four. So he wants to remind, reframe your confidence in shaky times 
here's the reminder that we need sometimes. We need to be reminded that Jesus is king and he's coming back. Jesus is king. And he's coming back. This is a classic, throughout the centuries, this is a classic confidence builder for Christians. Jesus is king. He's coming, Jesus is coming back. Spoken to any Christian, when everything feels like it's upside down, we just need to be reminded that a day is coming. In fact, sometimes we throw a little capital D on that. Because we know what we're talking about. A day is coming when evil will be no more. All the evil that we experience in the world, all the things that are wrong, will be no more. All will be made right. A day is coming when everything that you and I are made to love will be within reach, and we will know nothing but delight in the light of God's presence together. Jesus is king. He's coming back. Be reminded of that. Do you, do you remember, um, do you remember uh, as a kid when, uh, when you lived, uh, when an important day was coming up and you lived every day in light of that one day? Do you remember that? Like, you know, probably Christmas time was one of them. Or maybe it was your birthday or maybe for you, like right now, it's like retirement. But there's like one day, one day that's coming. And you live every light in light of, uh, of, that, of that one day. The lives, my family, we, we, we're going to leave town soon. This, you know, kind of the, on the annual 12-month calendar, it's one vacation. We just get, get to be far away and just be us and have some fun. And that, you know, it's been coming up. Uh, and um, so Courtney got the chalk out, and we've got one door painted with chalk paint. And so it's like X number of days to, you know, leave. And, and it's, it's actually been kind of fun because... Um, I've probably every member of the family has at some point changed the number or reminded us to erase it and adjust it, you know, and whatever, and you just keep walking past it. You're like, oh, it's coming. The, the number's smaller than it was a week ago. That, that's just kind of how it goes. And when you do something like that, you, you realize your focus on that one day reframes the entire season. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, hey, the day, the, you, you, when you know that day is coming, it changes how you plan, right? And, hey, hey, we're leaving town soon. Don't buy too many groceries. You know, like all, all the decisions start revolving around this one day. It, it, it changes how you plan because this one day is setting the tone for all the days. Knowing that day is coming changes your mood. <laughs> You're like, can't get me down. I'm out of here soon, you know? <laughs> Knowing that day is coming, it changes your behaviors. Don't make mom mad. I'm supposed to leave in four days, you know. <laughs> you see how it changes how you plan, changes your mood, changes your behaviors. Apply this to what we just read. Let me just show you again. These are verses you just read. Verse 6, I'm certain that God, who began the good work in within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished. On what? On the day when Christ Jesus returns. Look again with me at verse 10. He, he says, For I want you to know, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day Christ returns. A day is coming. Might be a Thursday. Might be a Saturday in winter. Might be an unseasonably warm day in October. But a day is coming, and either you will go to him or he will come to you. But a day is coming. And you might say to yourself, geez, Paul, we just got going in this letter. Don't you think it's kind of early in the letter to be talking about the end of the age as we know it? I mean, Paul, you're kind of coming in hot here. And you know what I think? I, I think? I think Paul would just kind of smile and say, well, when you, when you face threats and beatings and jailings on the regular, you, it has a way of making you look ahead to where this is all going. 
I think that's what Paul would say, but I think he would say it with this glint in his eye. Remember that quiet look of confidence? Kind of, I know something you don't know. Kind of glint. Everybody expects Paul to be shaken up. That's not a man who looks shaken up to me. It's what will lead Paul to write things like this. I love this line from Romans 8. He says this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will one day be revealed in us. Now, I'm sorry, it kind of grabs my throat, but I read present sufferings and I think of so many people in this room, like we, we're church, like we know what you're going through and, and this has gotten really heavy for you. Like really, really heavy. And there's, and there's no end in sight. You're like, when, 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 when? How long? And Paul says, well, look, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the future glory that will one day be revealed in us. And if you work backwards from that day that trumps every other day, the day of Christ Jesus, the day when evil is condemned to hell for eternity, the day when we all get to go home and the real party begins, if you live each day in light of that day and you Work backwards from that to where you are now. I promise you, people are kind of, people are going to wonder where your confidence comes from. When you can remain calm when everybody's going crazy. When you are determined to stick to doing what's right, even when it's unpopular. This is not bad logic. Well, Jesus is king and he's coming back. And I'm eternally secure. And he's making this go somewhere. He hasn't abandoned me. He's strengthening me. There's plenty of good for me to focus on in order to keep going. And every day that I stay in, I have a chance to see the truth proven with the life that I live.